welcome everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening uh, from uh, wherever you are. This talk is going to be about Kubernetes security, attacking and defending Kubernetes clusters. Um, as, uh, as Anne said, my name is Magno Logan, and I work for Trend Micro doing security research. So just a little bit about myself. As I said, I work at Trend Micro. I'm part of the cloud and container security team. I'm also a member of the CNCF tag security team, which is the, uh, the group inside the Cloud Native Computing Foundation that focuses on security matters for uh, the cloud native applications. I've been involved with OWASP since 2011. I led this uh, OWASP Paraíba chapter back in Brazil for five years and then be involved in different chapters and, and different projects as well. I also have a personal blog where I post articles uh, uh, regularly. Uh, there's also all my con in contact information there and my all my previous talks as slides or videos since 2011 as well when I started doing some uh, public speaking in, in conferences. Okay, so this is our agenda for today. I'll try to cover uh, as much as I can in, in 25, 30 minutes. Uh, but but yeah, basically we're, we're, we're going to talk about Kubernetes attacks and, and how to understand what attackers are doing in those environments and, and how can you uh, protect yourself from those uh, famous attacks. Uh, before I start, I just wanna say that uh, if you're if you're beginning your Kubernetes journey or if you're starting your research in in Kubernetes security, I created this GitHub uh, repository that's uh, open and available to everyone. That's called the Awesome Kubernetes Security List. It has a lot of materials, books, presentations, slides, and uh, a lot of uh, interesting things. Not just for Kubernetes security, but also for someone starting their, their Kubernetes journey, uh, because you need to understand the technology first so that you can focus on security later, right? So uh, I think that's a really awesome project that I started since uh, October last year, and it's been growing really fast. So feel free to star and, and fork it and, and submit any other links that you might have. So yeah. Um, this presentation, as, as we're going to talk about attacks, right? We have to mention the MITRE attack framework, which is a uh, uh, globally accessible knowledge base, right? Of, of opposing tactics and techniques based on real world scenarios. And it's used as a basis for development of specific threat models and methodologies in many different sectors. And what was interesting uh, to us when we start doing cloud and, and container research was yeah, there was a, a MITRE attack framework for the cloud, but there was none for containers until this year, right? So um, MITRE started this, this kind of call to, uh, to the community asking for, uh, for help and for data uh, related to in the wild attacks or real world scenarios that uh, could, could be used to create this kind of uh, MITRE attack matrix for containers, right? But before that, there was one uh, matrix that was released by Microsoft, but the guys at Azure are based on what they've seen in their own environment. So mostly AKS and, and their Kubernetes managed services. And, and then they released a new updated version this, uh, this year as well. This is not an official MITRE matrix, but it can give you uh, a great overview if you're looking to deploying Kubernetes and on Azure and, and understanding, okay, what are the main uh, techniques that our attackers, attackers are using to compromise my environment in, in Azure, right? So from December last year to, um, to April this year, we started working with MITRE and not just uh, as, as in Trend Micro, but other organizations as well, providing data and, and research information based on what we've seen in the wild, what we've seen in our Docker honeypots and our Kubernetes honeypots and analyzing what attackers are doing, right? And so this was the, the kind of the first version of the, the MITRE attack for containers. And I'd like to add that it's also about Kubernetes because there are some techniques there that are very specific to orchestrator or Kubernetes environments, right? So out of those 28 techniques, we came up with, uh, I think it was seven or eight 
uh, techniques that we uh, contributed to. And two of those techniques were brand new ones, techniques about uh, attacks that haven't been seen in the wild or, or weren't uh, categorized uh, in the MITRE framework. Okay, that's, that's, that's interesting. But before we had that uh, cool matrix, uh, we, are, we're, we were already doing some threat modeling in Kubernetes environments. And uh, here is the threat modeling that I did also based on the MITRE attack framework. As you can see, there are the, the tactics on the left. I don't know if you can see if it's a bit small there, but basically uh, looking to a scenario where there is a web application, right? And this web application is running inside a container or inside a pod in, in a Kubernetes scenario. And that application is exposed to the internet and has a vulnerability of remote command execution, right? And from there, from that vulnerable application, the attacker can compromise the, uh, the Docker container and then get inside your cluster and try to move laterally or, and compromise also uh, your worker nodes or your cloud environment if you're running on that. So we're going to analyze this using this, this model as a baseline. We're going to analyze this uh, scenario and see some common attacks that are, are possible in, in this uh, in, in kind of this scenario here and see later what we can do to avoid this from happening. Okay, yeah, this was kind of the, the website that I created, which I use for my uh, threat modeling, basically uh, a vulnerable Drupal web application from uh, three years ago from uh, version 8.5. And I just kind of made it a little bit interesting to, to hack. So the initial access, right, with the application, since this is outdated systems, uh, it has a, 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 a remote command execution vulnerability from the CVE there that you can, uh, the exploit is, is available on the internet. You can easily download and exploit that as well, right? This is one of the initial accesses uh, possible in a Kubernetes environment. Other two uh, scenarios, was the exposed dashboard for Kubernetes, which is not enabled by default anymore. So that's not the case, uh, depending on the version of Kubernetes that you have. But there is also the Cube API server, and which is basically the, the main entry point of all, all uh, requests to the Kubernetes and to the control plane, right? So um, especially on managed service providers such as AWS and, and Azure and Google, you have to be aware of if, if your Kubernetes uh, API server endpoint is public by default, right? Some services like EKS, they are. So like, do you really need that? Do you really want, if someone finds that API the endpoint, do you really want them uh, reaching that and finding information about your cluster, the version of your Kubernetes, version of the, the Go lang that's being used by your Kubernetes as well. So there is a lot of sensitive information there. So here is the API endpoint, just two examples there. One is uh, unmanaged Kubernetes clusters. So by default, the API server runs on port 6443. And uh, the second example is uh, a managed cluster running on EKS, as you can see from the URL there, and it runs on the, uh, for the port 443 by default. Um, so from there, depending on the permissions that you have, you can either uh, uh, just get version information or health information, which are the common uh, public API endpoints. But if, if that cluster is misconfigured, right, and it's not properly protected, there are other things that you are able to do. So one of interesting tools that are available if you if you don't know much about Kubernetes and, and you need to either uh, exploit a Kubernetes cluster or evaluate the security of your own cluster, uh, this is uh, this there is this tool called Cube Hunter, which is an open source tool provided by Aqua Security, and it helps you hunt for security weaknesses in Kubernetes clusters. It has uh, uh, kind of 37 uh, rules or, or, or vulnerability detections. There are misconfigurations that help you get a, a better overview of, of the security of your cluster. OK, let's say, yeah, uh, I was able to exploit that vulnerability, that CVE, remote command execution, and I have access inside a, a container of the web application inside the pod, right? So here are some um, 
sensitive information that I can uh, find out or, or grab from that from that pod to, that would probably leverage me into move laterally and, and find other uh, uh, entry points or escalate privileges, something like that, right? So first thing is, is the environment variables, right? If you check the Kubernetes environment variables, they're usually there for every pod and, and by default has information about the API server, IP, the port and, and other stuff that's running. Also uh, on every pod, there's a, a location where they, they store the service account and the service account token. And, and that service account you can use to uh, talk to the API server, right? So if you can if you can grab that information, which is easily available once you have access to the pod, then you can impersonate the kubelet and talk to the API server. And there is also another tool that's uh, available on GitHub that's uh, called MI Contained, which is basically a tool that runs a bunch of checks and tells you if you're if you are in a container or Kubernetes environment, it checks for if if the SecComp and App Armor are enabled, and also which capabilities you have on that container. So that's that's pretty interesting. So. Yeah, another another uh, possibility of attack, and and we've seen that in the wild in our uh, in our honeypots is the kind of privilege escalation and and kind of breaking out of that container and that cluster. Right here is an example provided by uh, Duffy Cooley from Isovalent, uh, which deploys um, basically a privilege container in the cluster, allowing you to break out of of that. Uh, of that environment and accessing the worker nodes, processes and files and everything, right? So one of the honeypots that we deployed in, in the wild, it took less than 24 hours for the attackers to compromise that uh, web application, right? Get access to the worker nodes, right? Escape, escape the container and get access to the worker nodes. And even after that, they, they were able to uh, grab the API keys of the cloud environment through the uh, instance metadata. And they were able to deploy uh, big, big instances and to mine cryptocurrencies, right? So this is kind of 95 to 99% of the attacks out there for Docker and Kubernetes. They usually either compromise your running containers to mine cryptocurrencies or they deploy uh, other new containers or other instances to do that. So that and you, that's something that you need to be aware of. Okay, so how can I um, defend Kubernetes, right? How can I protect my cluster from attackers? Isn't Kubernetes secure by default? Where do I start, right? So basic thing, the first thing that I mentioned in the beginning was the Cube API server, right? If you can see here, um, uh, even though I searched the, the root endpoint here of the API server, it already returns some information for me telling the API version, the status, and I can clearly see that this is a Kubernetes server running there, right, in, in the IP. And there are attackers monitoring the internet and you can find information on a showdown and senses and all those tools to find uh, uh, public available servers that there is a lot of, of clusters exposed out there that shouldn't be right so you in, in, in if you're not if there isn't a specific business need you shouldn't expose your cube api server to the internet another great guidance here is the cis kubernetes benchmark which was a, is a document created by uh, Rory McCoon and Liz Rice and, and other many contributors. And, and they are uh, security professionals in the cloud native world. And it has like a, a hundred plus uh, security checks for your Kubernetes clusters. And, and the interesting thing is that it shows you, it shows you how to check uh, if that proper uh, setting is enabled for, for your cluster. And if not, if that's not the expected result, it shows you also how to uh, fix that and, and enable that checking, right? So uh, that's really interesting. And it has also specific documentations for EKS and GKE. And I think uh, AKS for Azure, it should be uh, out there soon. Of course, you're not gonna, probably not gonna do that uh, uh, manually and, and 
this is a WASP event. We, we're talking about DevOps and DevSecOps and automation. So someone already solved that problem for you, which was also uh, an open source tool from Aqua called KubeBench, which you target your Kubernetes cluster and it runs all the checks that are recommended by the CIS Kubernetes benchmark. And it sees if your, uh, if your cluster is, um, is following those recommendations or not. So there's like a pass or fail check and also, um, also like a warning and tells you what you need to fix. So it's developed in Go and it's also open source. Anyone can contribute to it. Here's a basic, uh, basic example of the output of the Kubernetes benchmark. As you can see here, my cluster wasn't very uh, compliant to those rules. Okay. Uh, another thing that we need to be aware of is, is and we, we've been talking about uh, uh, supply chain attacks and S bombs, right? And software composition analysis. So even before you deploy a, uh, a Docker image or, or any kind of a container image to your cluster, you need to be aware of, of the, any kind of vulnerabilities uh, that, that may be there, right? So scanning that image for vulnerabilities or for any kind of misconfiguration or malicious software, uh, it should be also a step that you take before even deploying those in your in your cluster, right? So there are many tools out there that can do that for you, even uh, on depending on the uh, container register that you're using, they, they already ran some scans. And, and these are some of the, the famous ones out there. Okay, now, yeah, you scan the images that they are uh, properly, um, properly scanned. They don't have any kind of critical vulnerabilities and you need you deploy them, right? Okay, but what happens after they're deployed, right? What happens if there are any changes or for example, in our attack scenario here, the, the web application, the, the container is compromised. How do I know that something is going on? So that, that's a bit tricky because on uh, container environments, sometimes you don't have enough visibility with an agent installed on the node or unless you're using the new technology such as eBPF. And also uh, on managed services for Kubernetes, you usually don't have access to the control plane of that, of that cluster, right? The, the, the cloud provider manages that for you, which is a good thing, but it also is a bad thing because you don't have SSH access and you can't install agents to monitor that node for any kind of security issues, right? So that's why, uh, um, uh, here comes like Falco, which is a, a open source uh, security tool from the, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation it was developed by Sysdig and it uses uh, kind of the eBPF technology to parse Linux uh, kernel syscalls at runtime, right? So it's basically the IDS of Cloud Native applications. It detects any kind of unexpected behavior in a cluster. It, it's a rule-based engine, right? And you can create your own rules and it generates alerts based on those threats detected. So once you have those containers running, you should have something monitor, something such as Falco to monitor any kind of drift detection, any kind of changes, any kind of uh, updates or tools being installed or, or, or um, programs being executed, right? Processes being executed, such as the ones like mining Bitcoins or, or cryptocurrencies. Um, other recommendations here, more in general, is uh, um, for your pods itself, right? There are three things that you need to be aware. The pods in Kubernetes is basically uh, uh, your containers, but in the pods, you can have one or more containers running on the same pod. So the first thing is uh, uh, limit resources, right? You don't want your containers uh, demanding more resources than your uh, nodes can provide and then causing a denial of service on your node because of lack of resources. So limiting that on your cluster is, is very important and it's a basic uh, kind of um, verification as well as, as availability is part of, of security, right? Um, other things that you can do is apply a security context, right? There are some settings there that you can uh, configure on your pods that, for example, here I just bring three of them, but there are much more 
allow privilege escalation equals false, right? I don't want to allow this process to escalate privileges. Uh, read only root file system, right? The, uh, set to true and run as non root, right? So uh, as much as as it's, I think it's complicated to do. We we don't want your uh, uh, our containers running as root, right? Especially if they they are doing kind of sensitive tasks or have access to sensitive information. Um, another thing with the pause that you can do is setting the, the Linux uh, Linux kernel security modules, right? The LSM, uh, such as SecOmp, AppArmor, and SC Linux, right? So there are specific ones um, that you can enable there. And, and at least setting one of those would greatly uh, help your, your security overall of your containers and avoid any kind of container breakout there. So yeah, the security context is interesting, and and but how do you scale that? So there was something that I used to, that I was used for uh, for that it was called the pod security policy, but that's now being deprecated. You could apply that policy with all your security context to your whole cluster. Um, there is a new policy. I think it was, it's coming up in the new Kubernetes version already. But there is also some alternatives, and and you can use that to uh, protect your cluster. So how the pod security policy works, it works as a admission controller, right? So what does that mean? Basically, it controls the admission to the cluster, right? It's, it's kind of the, the security guard of a nightclub. It checks if your uh, uh, container has been scanned, checks if there are any critical vulnerabilities. You can establish your own policies and see if it's coming from uh, authorized registry and not being downloaded from Docker Hub or something like that, right? So you can do that with admission controllers on Kubernetes. Other tools that are alternatives to a pod security policy that you can use, they're also uh, very famous there. It's Isopa Gatekeeper and also Kyverno. Um, one other thing that's really important on Kubernetes and, and really hard to get it right and, and really easy to make uh, uh, mistakes is the road-based access control, right? Just like many web applications that we use nowadays, they use road-based access control, right? Uh, Kubernetes also does that. Uh, now that's enabled by default with, with Kubernetes, before a couple versions it wasn't. And all it, all it does, it creates four different objects in Kubernetes, allowing you to define a set of permissions and providing that to specific users. So on the RBAC or, or role-based access control, you have a role, which is an object that contains rules and represents like a set of permissions within a namespace. And you have a role binding, which is basically this object grants the set of permissions from a role to one or more users, right? And the other two objects that you have is the cluster role and cluster role binding, and which work kind of the same way as the role and role binding, but they apply, those permissions apply to a cluster level, right? So in Kubernetes, we have something called namespaces, which are basically kind of um, folders that allows you to separate your projects. And it's, logic, it's a logical separation. It's not, there's no like kind of security boundaries related to it. But, but you can maybe have like a, a dev namespace, a QA, a production namespace, or you can have a namespace separated by different teams, right? And, and so that's why this role is very specific one. And the cluster role is more general, more permissive, because it applies to the whole cluster of your, your Kubernetes environment, right? So you need to be aware of that as well when you're giving permissions to your users on Kubernetes. One more thing, and uh, I think on Kubernetes, has, there is like the database or the main data storage location for a cluster. It's by default, it's at CD, right? It's a key value store on, uh, has all your cluster objects, all your configurations are saved there. But we found out earlier this year that over 2,600, uh, 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 instances of etcd are exposed on, on Shodan, right? And not necessarily connected to a Kubernetes cluster because you can have etcd 
uh, as a standalone uh, key value store. But but this is the they usually have sensitive information, right? You're, it's just like exposing your database to the internet. So that's something that you need to be aware of. And uh, one thing on that CD that's done by default is the encryption in transit, right? Uh, which is great, but the encryption at rest is not done by default, right? By default, everything that you have on your cluster, all the configurations, all the sensitive information, even the secrets, are stored in plain text on etcd. To uh, encrypt that, you need a specific object called the encryption comp configuration object to be able to protect your sensitive information. Another thing that from security perspective can be very kind of surprising and scary at the same time is that by default on Kubernetes, all the pods, all the containers can talk to any other pod in the cluster. So it's, it's just like a flat network, right? From a security perspective, when I found that out, like, oh my God, right? So yeah, make sure you create a proper uh, network policy for your cluster. So network policies are objects that you can kind of segregate who can, who can talk to who inside your cluster, right? So uh, does the front end pod really need to talk to the database pod or not, right? So something like that, it's very important to have on your Kubernetes cluster. And last but not least, the audit logs. There's also, this is also something that are, are not enabled by default on Kubernetes. And it's highly recommended that you do that, enable them for security and troubleshooting, right? Uh, basically, you need two things to enable these audit logs, a log path where you're going to uh, store this, this file or in a policy file, right? What, what are you going to log, right? And you can set those up on the Kubernetes API server configuration, right? Basically, there are four uh, logging levels, non-metadata request and response. And you can set those up and, and configure what, what are the logs that you want. And you can also send them to a specific location like a SIEM server or on um, the Kubernetes managed services, for example, for uh, in EKS for AWS, they are uh, sent uh, to CloudWatch where you can later grab them and send to like an S3 bucket or to your scene of preferences. Okay, just to conclude my presentation here, um, but just remember the basics, right? I know there's a lot of information here, a lot of stuff to that you need to do before and after you deploy a Kubernetes cluster, but remember the basics, right? Kubernetes uh, changes version very early and often. I think now it's three times a year. Uh, and the latest version was 121. When I, when I wrote this presentation, I think I already changed to 122, right? So it, it, it updates very often. So be aware of that. Uh, don't use the cluster admin for your daily work, treat it like root, right? You don't want to use root for everything as well. And if you can, if you're just beginning your journey in Kubernetes and, and you're just learning and it's, it can be daunting and it can be a lot of complex stuff to learn, try using a Kubernetes managed service such as EKS, AKS, or GKE, because a lot of the security stuff and a lot of the, the kind of the grunt work they handle for you. So it's probably better to try that first. And don't forget to check out the Kubernetes, the CIS Kubernetes benchmark for more security best practice. So thank you for uh, everyone for having me here and for us for this great uh, uh, event and I'll be available on Slack for questions. Thank you. <laughs>